this is my third uh, spot here in in Holland in the last three days. So I want to try to be sure I don't just repeat myself, even though who has been coming to any of my classes so far? It was, okay, so yes, half of you have been to some. Yeah, on Facebook. Yes, and on Facebook. And so, um, yeah, I joined 1971, and I became Prabhupada's servant in 1972. John Mastami. Actually, John Mastami has been very... Um, favorable, I guess, for me, John Mastami Day, because I became Prabhupada's servant, John Mastami Festival time in New Vrindavan in 1972. And I was with him for 16 months to the end of 1973 as his personal servant. And then I, I left, I got married, went to Caracas, Venezuela, where I stayed there with my wife for six months, and then I went back to New Vrindavan again after six months. So now it's 1974, and it's a month before John Mastami. Yeah. 1972, when Prabhupada came, his servant, he had no servant, he had uh, left. So now, when I left, 1973, the end, Satsrup Maharaj became his servant. So after six months, Satsup Maharaj, he left Prabhupada's personal service to again preach as a sannyasi. So Prabhupada said yes. <clears throat> so now again, 1974, he came to that same place, New Vrindavan, where I had just gotten there two weeks soon before, and he didn't have a servant again. And I was there, and I had been traveling with Prabhupada Already, I went around the world two times. I've been I've been Zurich, Switzerland. I was in France. I was in Germany. I was in England. I was in Thailand. Of course, all over India, all over the U.S., South America. <laughs> um, so now I'm in New Vrindavan, and one day Brahmananda, who was his secretary again, Brahmananda, he was back and forth <coughs> the secretary. So he came up to me one day. And he said, do you want to be Prabhupada's servant? This was practically two years to the day that Kirtanananda Swami said the same thing to me. Do you want to be Prabhupada's servant? 1972, when I was asked, after living in New Vrindavan and traveling in the roadshow for almost a year, immediately when Kirtanananda came into the kitchen and asked me, I said, yes. <laughs> so now, two years later, and I had been Prabhupada's servant for 16 months, half of it in India, which means half of the time I was sick. <laughs> because I was always sick in India. Most of us were sick in India. But, um, so now, Brahmananda said, do you want to be Prabhupada's servant? And I just kind of looked. And I'm, first thing I looked, I said to him, where are you going? <laughs> That's how much the idea of going to India was scary. It was frightening for me. I had had malaria twice. I had jaundice. I said, say yesterday, I said, dysentery every month. I said, that was our problem. You know, so we got dysentery every month, so you would be flat out. And so I actually had to think about it for a few seconds. And I saw it. And I looked right where I was sitting, right up the hill, off of the Bahulaban farmhouse. Now we had a few little Prabhupada cottages. They were about the size of a garage. <laughs> Very simple. And my wife was in there, and now she was um, one, two months pregnant. And we were living there in New Vrindavan, and I looked up in there, and I looked at the little cabin. And I said, yes, I'll come. <laughs> so they arranged and they sent my wife to Los Angeles, gave her a nice apartment where she stayed, and I went off with Prabhupada again. While we were there, while Prabhupada was there, um, Kirtanananda Maharaj asked him if he could make Rasgula. New Vrindavan, of course, they had so much milk, and they were coming every, so many cows were milking. But they were making expert sandesh. This is what I made for Prabhupada all the time, sandesh. Traveling sandesh was the easiest, best sweet you could have. Because it, even he said to me, he said, it'll keep, if you make it properly, he said, it'll keep for a week without refrigeration. 
It means you got to make it very dry. Sand ash is not crumbly, it's not moist, it's very um, smooth because you press it, you press, you work it huh, with your hands. And it's dry. When you put it in, it's a little bit of sugar. I did one quarter sugar. The remaining three quarters was the pamir, which was pressed and then uh, smoothed out over a table, whatever, a board. And then you just cooked it slowly along the sides, it would come off and then that was it, you let it cool down. But rascul it was, that was difficult. If you know what good rascul it tastes like, we know when you go to India you find out right away rascul has to squeak. You know, we, would, we would get them from Casey Das. When I was in Calcutta, every day Prabhupada's sister would come with a box of Casey Das sweets. They were famous in Calcutta, or right? Casey Das. And all kinds of sandesh, rasgulla, rasmalai. Oh, it was delicious. And uh, she would bring, what's it called? Um, dahi. Dahi, what's it? Yoga. Hmm? Misti Dahi, yeah, yeah, yeah. West Bengal, Calcutta, famous for Misti Dahi. And that's when you have that for the first time. It's so good. It's like custard. Nothing. There's nothing um, soury about it at all. Very tasty. Kind of golden in color, caramel in color. Anyway, he would have the sweets on his right at the floor by where he sat, because that was the one thing. No one left Prabhupada's room without getting prasadam. Our movement is very much based on what he started with in the beginning. We do two things. We chant Hare Krishna and we take prasadam, and we distribute prasadam to everyone. Now we knew this was, it was our, our secret weapon, our open secret weapon. But the prasadam was very, very wonderful. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada's theory was ghee. <laughs> that was his method, ghee. The taste of ghee is what's going to um, change their taste buds, take it away from eating meat. Because ghee, you know, ghee is the blood of the cow, just another form. But it's that same, he says, that's how we take the blood of the cow, through the ghee. It's concentrated. So ghee was very special. I cooked every day, little bit. If I made four subjis, every subji had a choice, a tablespoon or two of ghee. But that was it. And on a daily basis, I he didn't eat fried things every day, just like us. We had like Sunday feast. And the Sunday feast was so many wonderful things. It started with sweet rice. We had something they called um, what's, Malpura. Anyone know what Malpura is? It's my favorite. Yes, it was our favorite. I guess it was basically like the puri dough, right? A little softer and you deep fried it. You know, so it absorbed again the ghee, the bread, and then you put it in yogurt, usually a strawberry yogurt, sweet strawberry yogurt. Every Sunday we had malpura, every Sunday we had chutney, pineapple chutney, or tomato chutney, samosa, or pachuri, puris, halava, sweet rice. And then, of course, you had a, a, a salty rice press. Two subjis. Hmm? Two subjis. Two subji, one with paneer. The paneer was fried in ghee. Prabhupada showed me at Bhaktivedanta Manor, remember, his room, those of you who have had the good fortune of being at Bhaktivedanta Manor, seeing Prabhupada's sitting room. So if you just, in front of his door, if you went to the left, not inside, outside left, and made a right, there was a door there. It was a closet. So that became the kitchen, my kitchen, to cook for mm -hmm. Prabhupada. Yeah. For a month. Prabhupada didn't like us going into the general kitchen. <laughs> he liked to protect, he tried to protect his men. Because, you know, it, that time was difficult. So anyway, that was the kitchen. It was literally maybe four or five feet wide. A cupboard. Yeah, it was a, it was a closet. It wasn't a walk-in closet, it was a closet. Anyway, I cooked for Prabhupada in there every day. I had a little stove. And I had literally a bucket of water to do everything, pause. So this is this is how I operated traveling around the world. 
So one day I went into his room before lunch and he said, I today he said, I want you to make this preparation. And he expected that he could just tell you and you'd you know, be able to apply all the, all the different principles of cooking to it. So he didn't spend a lot. He said, you take milk, he said, and you curdle it. He said, you know, quarter milk or half a gallon, whatever, or two liters, whatever. <laughs> so you curdle it, you make your paneer, and you save the whey. So now you get your ghee. He said, walk with a ghee. And of course, you press the paneer, make it nice and thick. You cut, cube, cut it in cubes, and you deep fry it in the ghee. Now, the paneer was the main ingredient of this. So you fried it medium heat but for a long time. You let it get very golden brown, even a little past golden brown, caramel color brown. It get crispy, it get hard, but you cook it for a long time in that ghee. Then you drain it and you put it in the whey, which is on the stove. You bring the whey up in heat, yeah, like almost to a boil. So now you put that very hard, crispy paneer in the whey. So it's going to become very tasty, very chewy. Very <laughs> and then he said, then you deep fry potatoes, same way, you cube them deep fried potatoes you throw that in to the whey then you throw some peas in there you don't have to deep fry the peas <laughs> then you deep fry cauliflower we do this at the end because cauliflower is very uh, you know, uh, soft it'll break up very quickly so you just flash fry that deep fry that and you put it in at the very end so you try to keep it consistent so you have paneer potatoes Peas. Peas and cauliflower. You know, a little salt. Then you make your chaunce. Chaunce is at those time, 1972, 73. We didn't have so many things, particularly outside of India. But So the basic chaunce that he showed me from the beginning, we always had cumin seed, coriander, turmeric, um, hing, of course, asafoetida, and chili. You know, red chili or green chili, whatever. So that was basically in mustard seeds. Sometimes. So that had basically all of those in there in the chance. And then you just throw it in the boiling. So I gave it to him the one day. This was in addition to rice, chapatis, dal, and three other dry subjis. So he liked it very much. So the next day he said, you make that again today. He said that every day for 10 days. He had me make that vegetable every day for 10 days. With the same paneer so every day i put that together for him so Prabhupada had very specific taste and he said of course <laughs> tamal krishna maharaj he would sometimes he could never understand because whenever you would go to mayapur west bengal calcutta everyone's cooking in mustard oil and Prabhupada had made a statement so tamal krishna maharaj said to him Prabhupada, he said you say that ghee is for the inside of the body and oil is for the outside of the body. Isn't that right? Prabhupada said, yes, yes. He said, but they hear, he said, they all eat, they use mustard oil. He said, Prabhupada said, well, it's very tasty. <laughs> so taste, taste also was a factor. So he said it was tasty. But when I was in Calcutta with Prabhupada, we were there for a few weeks. This was also 1973, and Prabhupada's sister would come to see him. She was so excited when Prabhupada would come home to Calcutta, his, his younger sister. And we, we called her Pishima, which meant auntie. Her name was Baba Tarini. She was also a disciple of Bhakti Saranta Saraswati Thakur. So they were godbrother, godsister, and she was his little sister. And she just loved being around Prabhupada all the time. So when he would come to Calcutta, of course, she would come, she would bring her sweets, she would bring misty dahi for the devotees and the different Prabhupada's disciples and all. And she carried around a little flask, like a little bottle, glass bottle, with Gunga Jal. So when, whenever she would approach us, she would always throw the Gunga water, the Gunga water on us. I don't know 
that was how she could approach us after she put it on us. Mm -hmm. It was just the way she blessed us. She had a lot of faith in the Gunga dolls. But she would always, that was one of her things she would throw. And she also had another bottle she would bring into the temple. Anyone know what was in it? Mustard oil. Mustard oil. Because we never had mustard oil. I had mustard oil. I was the only devotee had must because I massaged Prabhupada with mustard oil every day. So she would smuggle it into the temple and cook for him. In India, I didn't cook for Prabhupada. There were always many of my god sisters who were experts, so they would cook. We took a Malati, Jamuna, um, Palika, Shruti Rupa, Arundhati, Kasalya. There's over a half a dozen different ladies at different times as disciples who would cook for him. Outside of India, I always cooked for them. Inside of India, the, they were qualified. Huh? So his sister, she would cook for him. And then we would also cook the way he trained us to cook, which was, again, everything was with ghee. Everything was ghee. Chapatis, you put a little ghee on the top of the chapati. His rice, you would put a little ghee on the top of his rice. Because that helps everything. It's actually, I mean, in so many ways, it, it's uh, so good. I just read yesterday a quote from Prabhupada saying, as soon as the child is born, immediately he needs milk. He said for developing the brain. Huh? Milk is required. And he would say, we were just discussing, he would say how the, it develops the finer tissues of the brain. So he even made distinctions of what was going on. So he said the finer tissues, because that's what, how you understand Krishna consciousness. Through, the, through our, the brain, we have to develop. And he said it was very, very important. Himself, Prabhupada, every evening he had a cup of milk. Every night, boil it three times up and down. That was our method we learned right away. First thing you learned, you came into the temple. I learned how to make ghee within one week of entering the temple because we were always making ghee because we used a lot of ghee. So um, his sister would cook, we would cook, and I would bring in his lunch in Calcutta every day. So now I always say, I've told this before, well, things that happen with Prabhupada, he would usually... It would go on three times. He, he didn't challenge you if you did something first time, second time. But by the third time, it meant it's time to do what I want you to do. Like he said to me, after I was massaging him for a year, and every place I touched, if I did his head, you did it until he went. Then you did his back until he said, okay. You never left that position. I did it this way for a year. I could massage his back sometimes for 40 minutes. I'd be exhausted because he told me, you can massage my back as hard as you like. That was like a challenge to a 22-year-old boy. You know, as hard as you like. So I thought, okay, I, I accept. I'm pushing, pushing. And he'd just sit there on the floor in his gumcho on a straw mat, what did he weigh? 110 pounds or something maybe, you know, Prabhupada was very light, was small, but he was guru, he was not light, he was heavy. So I'm pushing and pushing and he's just sitting there like nothing at all is happening to him. And I'm working up a sweat because I'm determined to get to the point where he says, all right, that's a good place, that's hard enough. He never said it, he never said it. To the point where I just finally, I surrendered to the fact that I couldn't, I couldn't defeat his heart enough. So that went on, and then, then he would again go. But then you went to the side, did his arms, his belly, and go to the other side. But everywhere you went, you would just wait until he said, "Okay." Imagine. So after a year, because while you're massaging him. There's this cooker. It might be 50 feet away. It might be 500 feet away in a kitchen somewhere. But there's this cooker with this entire lunch in it. The dolls in the bottom. All these vegetables are steaming in the middle. 
That's what you add your chons to. So his vegetables were actually steamed vegetables and then chons. Some of them you did by themselves, like bitter melon, little turmeric and salt, a lot of ghee, and you just fry them up until they were crispy. Very tasty. Very simple, very tasty. So while you're massaging him, anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours, all of that's cooking. Now everyone, well, any, anyone that cooks knows it doesn't take two hours for any vegetable to cook. It doesn't take anything two hours. Not your hardest doll doesn't take two hours. But you're massaging him for one and a half to two hours and that cooker's in the other room. That's all I ever thought about. Every massage was I hope nothing goes wrong. Cause, and that's why some, some servants didn't cook. Because they could never feed. You turn the flame to a certain spot. And so it never burnt the doll, never dissolved. Somehow or other it worked. It was just rather on his mercy. But it worked. They said I, I cooked for him probably, well I figured out two and a half years. So it was almost one year I didn't cook for him when he was in <laughs> India. But otherwise I cooked for him in that cooker about 500 times. He never complained once except one day and that day I didn't cook for him. And he complained to me, he said, why did you, I let some boy, who was Shiradakshai's son, what's his name, uh, mm -hmm. Shiradakshai, Karunadakshai? Karunadakshai. Huh? Karunadakshai. Yeah, the oldest son. Mm -hmm. So at the time I'm 22, he might have been all 15 years old maximum, and he asked to cook for Prabhupada. So to me, I thought, yes, because I'll massage him and you'll be cooking and I don't have to have that anxiety. But it was, <laughs> I had much more anxiety. <laughs> because we brought it in together. And I said, Prabhupada, did he cook today? And Prabhupada says, yes, okay, very nice. So then I go back out. And you would always put one japati on Prabhupada's plate, his lunch plate. Then you would just run back into the kitchen, make another japati, mm. put puffs up. Put ghee, a little ghee on the top, you run back in, you slide it on his plate, you offer obeisances, and you keep doing that until he says, okay, that's enough. So now I come back in with the second chapati by myself. And we went in together, me and the boy. And he says to him, very nice, very nice, Prashadam. So then we go out, I come back in with the chapati, and he looks at me, he said, what have you done? I said, oh, Prabhupada, he, he cooked for you today. He asked to cook, and I, he said, were you with him at all? He said, this is unedible. He said, how am I supposed to eat this? He says, these chapatis, like that. He, he's the mud, the doll is like mud. He said that to me several times when, <laughs> when not my doll, I would bring Raj Bogue. He would ask for it because he knew the deities were not being taken care of nicely. And his barometer was Raj Bhog. If Raj Bhog is not going on properly, then it means the deities are neglected. And Wait, it means Can you explain what is Raj Bhog? Raj Bhog. Raja kings. The Bhog is the offering, the meal. So Raja is the king. So we would make ten to twelve preparations. So he would have this and and he would ask for it in the temple because he knew something was wrong. And that's that was how he dealt with it. He would he would bring in the leaders and he would sit with the deity Mahaprasadam. And he grabbed the chapati and he said, This chapati, this chapati is terrible. Chapati should puff up chapati. Then he would try the doll. This doll is like mud. How can anyone eat this? Who is cooking for the deities? Why are they being neglected? And then he would go into the kitchen. Oh, a dirty kitchen. Maybe yelling at everyone. Because Radha Krishna, you're cooking for Krishna, he would say. So he was very, um, he wanted to see everything was very, very nice. Huh? Everything was done properly. So every day I was making like Raj Bhog for Prabhupada, but nothing in ghee, nothing fried in ghee. But it was like that. He had like ten preparations, but everything had to be made very nicely. So... That anxiety was there while I was giving him massage, what was going on with the cooker. So then, um, 
as I said, evening. So Prabhupada's diet, he lived as a Ayurvedic lifestyle. You know, he never spoke, very rarely Prabhupada would speak about Ayurveda. Sometimes in my presence he would say, like we take massage. He said, the morning sun gives you energy. So if the weather was pleasant, Prabhupada would go outside for his massage because he would take the sun. The sun's giving you vitamins, eh? vitamin C, so many things you're gaining from the sun. So he liked that. So he say the morning sun gives energy, afternoon sun drains your energy. Then he would say things like, your um, digestion is like the sun. The higher the sun is in the sky, the better your digestion. So your main meal, he said, which his main meal was lunch, because that's when your digestion. So everything he did, he also considered his health. I massaged him, like I said, hour and a half to two hours in the morning with mustard oil huh, absorbing into the skin and circulation, huh, getting the blood flowing. It was also he was healthy to spread Krishna consciousness. That's how he could do his service. In Hawaii, in the early days, he wrote the importance, important list for the devotees. So the first thing on the list was what? We had chanting, service, health. So the first thing on the list was health, not chanting your japa. Because if you're not healthy, you're no good to anyone. <laughs> you can't do anything. We can't do our service. We're not. We can chant, perhaps. And he would say, if you're in health, then just chant. You have nothing else to do. But that was not Prabhupada's mentality, just sit and chant and not do anything else. Prabhupada was preaching. Prabhupada always wanted to give Krishna to everyone. So that was always the main focus. So you have to be healthy. Like I see traveling around every day, different place. When I think of Prabhupada doing it, it was difficult for me then, when I was 20. He was already seven in his 70s, traveling around the world, never complaining. Don't feel good about this. I said, Prabhupada had a way of... <laughs> you knew... If he didn't feel well, he would ring his bell and he would say, oh, today for lunch I'll have kitri. That many didn't feel good. Something was off, he would say. So one day he did that. He said to me, I'm not feeling uh, so well. He said, today I don't want any lunch. So for me, that was, <laughs> that was actually re a relief because that two-hour period was very... <laughs> Challenging, cooking for him and massaging him, arranging his clothing. He's going to bathe, getting everything ready for bath, getting at it, everything at the desk, his tea lock ready. At the desk, he would put his tea lock on just before lunch after bathing. He would say, Gayatri. I would lay his clothes out on the bed so when he came out of the bath. So all these things are going on in a period of 20 minutes when he would walk into the bathroom. So this was... Um, this is what you did, right? your service. This was personal service. Always attentive. I said it's like the personal servant is pujari. But the deities are always moving. Prabhupada was always moving. But it's the same kind of service. You're cooking for him, you're dressing him, helping with bathing. You're a pujari. But like he said, I'm always moving around. So you had to keep up with <laughs> You had to keep up with him. So today he said, today I have no lunch. So I, I thought, okay, well that's, I just give him a massage. He goes and bathes everything. Easy, e easy day for me. Not that I felt good, but he was not feeling well. But the anxiety level was less for me. So then we start the massage. I'm massaging and do his head. You spend like 15 minutes just briskly doing everything on his head. Prabhupada used what on his head? What kind of oil? Sandalwood. Sandalwood oil. Because he said you have to keep a cool head. Sandalwood is cooling to keep the cool head. You know that story? I think it was Chicago. No, it was not Chicago. There's actually a picture of it. It's in New York. There's a picture of Prabhupada looking, him and I are looking at each other and we're both smiling. So that was a conversation Prabhupada had with one reporter, lady reporter. 
So, of course, this was 1970s. Yeah. So, mini skirts were very popular back then. So, she's in a very short dress, young lady. If you're a reporter, it means you're pretty, basically. If you're a woman, you're, <laughs> you're going to be a pretty young lady in those days. So, she's asking Prabhupada questions, you know. And, and then she said, um, you know, why do you shave your head? When Prabhupada heard that kind of a question, he would immediately become, this person is not very serious to understand what we're up to. Because that's a question, why do you shave your head? So he said to her, why do you shave your legs? <laughs> <laughs> so then she was caught off guard. He said, better. He said, keep a cool head, warm legs. Like that. Yeah. So, so he was never defensive. You couldn't, you couldn't make Prabhupada feel ashamed or embarrassed about who he was, who devotees are, how we dress, nothing. And, you know, when once a reporter said, you're preaching all the, we hear the devotees are sleeping on the floors, your disciples, they're eating off of the floor, they're sleeping on the floor, and you're being driven around in a Rolls Royce. He said, how, Why? He said, why a Rolls Royce? He said, it should be a gold car. This was Prabhupada. You couldn't make him, oh, I am. Mean, no. He was giving Krishna to everyone. That's what he said. Even I, I'm in a gold car, that's not enough. Should be in a Vaikuntha like, airplane. <laughs> so that's how he spoke. So then she, she started talking about the women, the women, the equality. The women, their equality is not there. And <laughs> Prabhupada said, so he said, a 16-year-old boy, he can go around the world traveling by himself. No one will bother him. He said, what about a 16-year-old girl? So she didn't answer. So then she said, well, let's change the subject. Because she, she said, I'm not getting anywhere with this <laughs> Let's change the subject. And Prabhupada looked at me. He said, what did she say? I said, Prabhupada, you've defeated her. <laughs> and then he laughed. So he just laughed. Uh -huh. But that's what he was saying. You can't let a girl, young girl, go by her own around the world. And we've seen it. You know, we see it over and over again, especially going to India. Whenever I see a devotee, young devotee girl by herself, I said, you cannot just go there by yourself. I said, you have to always be with someone, even a man. No one wants to be by themselves anymore. Oh, Krishna Balaram Mandir, 9 o'clock at night, you don't go outside the grounds. You just, it's not a good idea. Everywhere, not just India, not just Vrindavan, anywhere in the world. So many dangers. So, I'm massaging him. He said, no lunch today. So now I'm massaging his back. And he says, I'll have Kitri. I haven't done anything. I have Kitri Japati, he said. I was like, oh, gee. But I thought, Kitri's not very difficult. I, I can handle making Prabhupada Pada Kitri. This is simple. Yes, Prabhupada. Now I'm massaging away. Then I get to the side of him. He says, I've decided I'll have complete lunch. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm, I said, Prabhupada, I haven't even begun. That's all right. Whenever it's ready, you bring which means you bring it the regular time. <laughs> but that's how he said it, maybe. So as soon as I finish massage, he goes into the shower. i got to make a chapati dough. i got to set up the entire cooker. Rice, dal, cut up vegetables. So as quickly as I could get everything done. So Prabhupada would take a shower after massage. Now his body's covered in oil. So he uses soap. He bathes out of a bucket. Everywhere in the world, just like he did in Vrindavan, no change. His showers are overhead, bathtubs. He just fills the bucket up with water, and that was all. Never changed. Didn't use the shower. I mean, you can read things that will tell you that water beating on your head is very bad for you. you know? And now they say even the shower heads themselves, there's so much gunk in those things. There's so much stuff coming out of them. Kinds of what you're, uh, moldy. You look at the black mold. So much stuff is in there. Prabhupada never did that. Never used the shower. He brushed his teeth with what? Who knows? Anyone knows? Datum. Anyone know what datum? 
stick. It's a twig. Mango twig, eucalyptus twig, neem tree. Looks like the size of a pencil. So in the morning, it had to be there in the bathroom. Huh? Four o'clock in the morning, there had to be fresh twig, datum. Otherwise, where is datum? You'd say, that was, where is datum? Then you run outside, you have to find some tree somewhere. <laughs> you might be here. Try to find a mango tree, a eucalyptus tree. Uh, yeah. So then he would take that datum and he chew it on in that, but it was a toothbrush. And what do you do with it when you're done? You throw it away. What do we do with our toothbrush? We put it in that little stinky glass, plastic <laughs> glass, plastic toothbrush, all kinds of things growing in there day after day, and we stick it back in our mouth. Last week we had a cold. That's okay. Put that stuff. No, that's not Ayurveda. That's not Vedic culture. So lota. We don't even know what lotas are. Everything plastic, plastic buckets plastic cups in the bathroom. Nothing but nonsense. Prabhupada saw that it was not his world. So anyway, I did prepare the lunch that day, but that was the only thing. Prabhupada didn't complain. He didn't say, oh, my knees are hurting, my back is hurting. He never said those things. In the Bhagavatam purport, first canto, one of the purports that Prabhupada describes, the pure devotee, he said he's unaffected by the modes of nature, by the threefold miseries. He's unaffected. Doesn't mean these things aren't going on. He's transcendental. He's transcendental to all of it. He's just serving Krishna in any condition. Heaven, hell, leukemia, whatever it is. He just wants to serve Krishna. That was Prabhupada's mood. Not that he complained, oh my, you know, really this was, flight was so long, we know one of my one of the stories, some devotees is her favorite stories. It just shows how Prabhupada is determination. So we were flying a total of over twenty-five hours of flying. And we stopped in um, Bangkok, Bangkok, Thailand, at the airport. And we were switching air, everything switched, which means all your bags come off, which you know I was dealing with in the secret secretary mainly. And you have to go to the other airline. All the bags go back on. They took all the bags in 1973. You know, airports weren't very... Now they look like, you know, shop. everything's a shopping mall. This glorified shopping malls. Except for Singapore. Right? It's like a glorified Garden of Eden or something now. <laughs> Most beautiful airports, right? Juhu. I saw the Juhu um, domestic airport. It was like a beautiful garden. Plants everywhere. Waterfalls coming down. Anyway, it wasn't like that in 1973, especially in the airports in India. Um, so we flew from there after flying 20 hours. We're in Bangkok, Thailand. And the suitcases are over all together, us hundreds of suitcases, everybody. So we're in the transit lounge for hours. So Prabhupada looks at me and he said, I need to bathe. There is no showers, you know, no, there are no um, places to bathe, there are no shower. Now you go to showers, you, know, you get your showers, everything's available. Then not like that. He said, I need to bathe. He said, go get me a change of clothes. So I go, I open the suitcase, I got to get a gumcha, get him a change of clothes, a towel. So we just walk into this bathroom, it's twice the size, you know, there's... 15 sinks along the wall, all the little stalls, toilet stalls, urinals on the other side, people walking in and out constantly. There's an attendant right at the door. So now we go into the bathroom, we walk in, and I've got his clothes, got a towel, got his gumsha, put the gumcha on him. You know, Prabhupada would put, put your arms around you, have the gumcha, you drop everything that's underneath. And uh, so now he's got his gumcha. I have his lota, very famous lota. This lota had also like a personality. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada gave everything personality. I'll tell that after. So I have his lota. So he's, he surveys the situation. He goes, okay. He said, take the water from the sink, warm, you know, make it nice, very warm. He said, and I'll bathe right here, right in the floor, right in the middle of, right in the middle of the, 
the bathroom. Mm. Prabhupada was transcendental. He didn't, he never, it was one of the very fun things traveling with him. Being outside of the temple was the most fun because inside.